India lands on the moon, Russia crashes on the moon, and Rocket Lab flies its first reused engine. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 25th of August, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin have received a major government contract to develop a satellite constellation in orbit for the United States Space Force. Well, technically, it's for the Space Development Agency, or SDA, but this agency is part of the U.S. Space Force. SDA has been working with commercial space companies for a few years now to develop several different constellations of satellites in low Earth orbit to support the U.S. national defense. Each of these constellations are what the agency calls a tranche, and each constellation has groups of satellites with different capabilities, each being called a layer. Each of these layers represents a different type of satellite. For example, the tracking layer on each tranche consists of satellites that have the capability to track missiles and other high-speed objects from other countries that could pose a threat to the U.S. national security. Other layers, such as the transport layer or the deterrence layer, are about in-space communications and in-space defense mechanisms, respectively. The idea behind these different tranches and layers is that by having multiple of these smaller satellites in low Earth orbit, instead of just one big satellite in a geosynchronous orbit, the whole system can be more resilient and cheaper to build and launch. For example, if a satellite fails or is disabled by another country, there's still dozens of them in orbit to take up the job, and the whole constellation would still be working without any major issues. Now, the agency started off first with Tranche Zero, which has the tracking layer and the transport layer. The companies chosen to build those satellites were York Space Systems, Lockheed Martin, L3 Harris, and SpaceX, which has also launched the first of these Tranche Zero missions and will launch the second one just next week. And by the way, in case you were wondering, SpaceX didn't get the contract for the transport layer for Tranche Zero, the one with the communication satellites, but actually for the tracking layer, which is the one that tracks missiles. Now, Tranche 1 contracts were awarded early last year to Lockheed Martin, York Space Systems, and Northrop Grumman for its transport layer, and L3 Harris and Northrop Grumman for its tracking layer. Tranche 1 flights are set to begin as early as late 2024, also on board Falcon 9 rockets, as well as with ULA's Vulcan launching some of those missions as well. This week, the SDA released another one of these major contracts for the Tranche 2 transport layer, which was awarded to Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin. Launches of these satellites are projected to begin in September of 2026, although no launch vehicle has been chosen as of yet. Now, in total, the SDA has now awarded contracts to launch 28 satellites for Tranche Zero, 154 satellites for Tranche One, and 72 satellites for Tranche Two, with 100 extra Tranche Two transport layer satellites expected to be awarded later down the line. Russia's Luna 25 lander crashed on the moon this week, and the irony is that it didn't happen while it was trying to land. If you remember, this lander was launched back on August 10th on board a Soyuz. Luna 25 was sent successfully to the moon, and it entered into orbit around it on August 16th. This initial orbit around the moon was an elliptical orbit with its lowest point at 91 kilometers and its highest at 113 kilometers. The orbit was planned to change a few more times, with Luna 25 set to enter a pre-landing orbit on August 19th, and it was on this last maneuver when things started to go wrong. The maneuver was expected to lower the lowest point of Luna 25's orbit down to about 15 kilometers, at which point the lander would have then started its descent down to the surface two days later on August 21st. About four hours after the maneuver was set to take place, Roscosmos issued a statement declaring that an emergency situation occurred on board, which did not allow the maneuver to be performed with the specified parameters. This was also followed later with further information from Russian officials stating that the agency had lost communications with the spacecraft. Now this was in part expected because Russia, unlike the US or Europe, doesn't have a worldwide network of deep space antennas. This means it could only communicate with the spacecraft when the moon was above Russia. So everyone had to wait until the following day to hear any more news about Luna 25's situation, but it certainly didn't sound great. And that's precisely what was confirmed by Roscosmos the following day. Scientists were searching for signals from the lander, and they just couldn't find it. 
The agency also stated that according to the results of a preliminary analysis, the device switched to an off-design orbit and ceased to exist as a result of a collision with the lunar surface. Now that cease to exist expression is certainly some creative wording to otherwise say the spacecraft is now just another crater on the moon. On August 21st, the head of Roscosmos, Yuri Borisov, confirmed that data analysis showed the engine used for the orbit change ran for 127 seconds instead of the 84 seconds planned. This obviously lowered the lowest position of the orbit so much so that it eventually led to the crash of the lander. According to calculations done by the Kieldish Applied Mathematics Institute, they estimated that the lander might have crashed on the moon on August 19th at 11.58 UTC on the Ponte Gulan G crater. It's certainly quite a bummer to lose a mission like this before even trying to land in the first place, but that's how spaceflight usually goes. It's very unforgiving. Sometimes you win, and sometimes you don't. Now let's take a look at This Week in Launches. This Chongzhang 4C rocket lifted off on August 20th at 1745 UTC from the South Launch Site 2 at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. It was carrying the fourth Gaofen-12 satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. The Gaofen-12 satellites are civilian Earth observation satellites with remote sensing capabilities. This type of satellite uses a microwave remote sensing system with a resolution of under 1 meter. These satellites are normally used for urban planning, land census, and crop yield estimation, among others. This week, we had a Falcon 9 launching from a surprisingly clear Vandenberg on August 22nd at 9.37 UTC. The rocket was carrying a batch of Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The booster, B1061, was flying for a 15th time, which made it the fourth booster to reach this milestone. Approximately eight minutes after launch, it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. This mission was the first one under the Group 7 batch of Starlink missions. These are Starlink missions that fly V2 mini satellites into Starlink's second generation constellation, but at 53 degrees orbital inclination instead of 43 degrees, which is what the Group 6 missions have been doing so far. This slightly higher inclination allows for better coverage over mid-latitudes, which is where most of the world's population lives and where Starlink is most likely to be used. With this launch, SpaceX has now launched 4,983 satellites, of which 3,907 are now in operational orbit. A Soyuz 2.1A rocket lifted off on August 23rd at 108 UTC from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. It carried the Progress MS-24 cargo spacecraft into low Earth orbit. Progress MS-24 is the third Russian resupply mission of the year to the International Space Station, carrying almost three tons of supplies and fuel to the orbiting laboratory. Docking with the aft port of the Zvezda service module took place on August 25th at 3.50 UTC. North Korea tried again this week to launch their Cholima-1 orbital rocket. According to the Japanese government, the rocket launch took place on August 23rd at 18.50 UTC from the Sohei Satellite Launching Station. The launch, however, was not successful, as reported by North Korean authorities. According to the report, the rocket had a third-stage malfunction that prevented it from reaching orbit. The Cholima-1 rocket was carrying essentially a copy of the Meilingyang-1 reconnaissance satellite that the country had tried to launch back in May, which also ended in failure. North Korea says it will attempt a third launch of this rocket no earlier than October. After a two-week delay, Rocket Lab finally launched its Electron rocket for the We Love the Nightlife mission. Liftoff took place on August 23rd at 2345 UTC from the company's Launch Complex 1B launch pad in New Zealand. Electron was carrying the first of Capella Space's Acadia satellites, which features a synthetic aperture radar antenna that allows the satellite to capture images of the ground at any time of day and in any weather condition. The launch was interesting, as the company had changed the first stage as a result of the issues encountered on the previous launch attempt. Now, this different first stage was not only in reusable mode, but also sported the first reused Rutherford engine, meaning that it had already flown on a previous mission. According to Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck, this engine performed flawlessly, and the booster was recovered from the ocean after it had done its job. Next step for Rocket Lab will be the reuse of a complete electron booster on a mission in the next few months, so best of luck to the teams! India is on the moon! The country's Chandrayaan-3 lunar lander is now safely on the lunar surface after a 40-day trip to our celestial neighbor. 
If you've watched any of our episodes over the last month or so, you probably know by now that that launch went up without a hitch on July 14th and that the spacecraft entered orbit around the moon on August 5th. The Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft consists of two main parts, the propulsion module and the lander itself. This propulsion module is essentially what helped the lander get to the moon and enter orbit around it. On August 17th, the propulsion module had already brought the lander into a 153 by 163 kilometer orbit around the moon and was no longer needed. This propulsion module contains its own communications, power, and propulsion systems, so now it's an orbiter spacecraft on its own. As a result of the precise burns executed up until its separation from the lander, the Indian Space Agency estimates that this orbiter has plenty of consumables left to orbit the moon for well over a year, and it will be able to provide relay capabilities to the lander during its mission duration. The lander performed two burns on its own to lower its orbit to a 25 by 134 kilometer orbit in preparation for its landing. This is the kind of pre-landing orbit we mentioned earlier in the episode that Luna 25 tried to achieve and overshot, which ultimately led to its crash on the moon. But fortunately for Chandrayaan-3, this was not the case. The lander started its descent on August 23rd, with touchdown on the lunar surface occurring at 1232 UTC. India is now the fourth country to soft land a spacecraft on the moon, and the first to do so near the south polar regions of the moon at a roughly 69.3 degrees south latitude. Shortly after landing, the spacecraft released the small rover Pragyan, which has already started its operations on the moon. The mission is planned to last about half a lunar day, so about 14 Earth days. After that, the lack of sunlight and the cold lunar night might make the lander inoperable, and it might not work at all by the time the sun rises. However, ISRO has said that they would probably continue the mission if the lander gives any signs of life once the sun comes out. This is definitely quite an achievement for India and its space program, which adds yet another success to their list. Perhaps the moral of the story here is that while the previous mission, Chandrayaan-2, did not successfully land on the moon, they've since solved all of their issues and they gave it another shot. Congratulations to everyone involved. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. This week, Representative Dale Strong of Alabama announced that Blue Origin has brought to life Test Stand 4670 at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. The company performed a firing test of its BE-3U engine on the test stand, which is configured for testing that engine, and also the BE-4 engine. In fact, you can see a BE-4 on the stand in the video. This historic stand was used in the 1960s to perform long-duration firings of Saturn V first stages, and it's really great to see it back in action. Stoke Space has announced that it has rolled Hopper 2 onto its test stand. This new reusable upper stage prototype will be conducting propellant load tests and firing tests, which will culminate in a vertical takeoff, vertical landing hop test of the vehicle, hopefully sometime later this year. ESA's space debris removal target has ironically been hit by space debris. This target was an old Vega payload adapter that was left over from a mission in 2013 and was going to be retrieved and disposed of by the Clear Space One spacecraft. Early data after the debris impact suggests that the adapter is still intact but has shed some debris as a result. However, the debris removal mission is still continuing its development as planned. This is another reminder that space debris is trash. Literally. And now let's go over next week in spaceflight. SpaceX's next crew flight, Crew 7, was scrubbed earlier today with NASA and SpaceX citing more need for checkouts and analysis ahead of launch. The new launch time is set for August 26th at 7.27 UTC, and that means a new docking time is set for August 27th at 12.50 UTC. JAXA's H-2A rocket is scheduled to launch on August 27th at 30 past midnight UTC from the Tanagashima Space Center. It'll carry the CRISM X-ray telescope and the slim lunar lander. Yep, another one of those. After a few delays and Crew 7's mission moving to August 26th, the Falcon 9 with the Starlink Group 611 mission is now set for August 27th. The first launch opportunity is set for 105 UTC, with three more opportunities available up until 304 UTC. A ULA Atlas V rocket is set to launch on August 29th from Florida at 1234 UTC. The mission, dubbed Silent Barker, will be in support of the National Reconnaissance Office and the U.S. Space Force. Another Falcon 9 launch is set to take place on August 30th from Vandenberg, carrying the second batch of SDA's Tranche Zero satellites. 
Liftoff time is unknown at this time, but expected to take place sometime in the morning local time. SpaceX will then try to launch another Starlink mission on August 31st. The first opportunity would be set for just 15 minutes before midnight UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.